Welcome here to St. Francis, where we are gathering in person and online. And we apologize to those coming in from afar online as we had a little bit of technical difficulty this morning. So thank you for uh, worshiping with us and having Holy Communion. We will begin our service. By singing our opening hymn. Please stand if you are able. Son and Holy Spirit. And bless us, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. First reading is from the book of Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac may, shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel the word of the Lord. Please join me in reading Psalm 85. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who tune their hearts to him. Truly his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, 
This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Christ according to Mark. King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets at hold. But when Herod had heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod with, and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Yesu 
菲利的妻子希罗底的缘故，差人去拿住约翰所在监里，因为希律已经娶了那妇人。约翰曾对希律说：“你娶你兄弟的妻子是不合理的。”于是希罗底。怀恨他，想要杀他，只是不能，因为希律知道约翰是义人，是圣人，所以敬畏他，保护他，听他讲论，就多照的行，并且乐意听他。有一天恰巧是希律的生日，希律摆设筵席，请了大臣和千夫长，并加利利做首领的。希罗底的女儿进来跳舞，使希律和同席的人都欢喜。王就对女子说：“你随意向我求什么，我必给你。”又对他起誓说：“随你向我求什么，就是我国的一半，我也必给你。”他就出去对他母亲说：“我可以求什么呢？”他母亲说：“施洗约翰的头。”他就急忙进去见王，求他说：“我愿王立时把施洗约翰的头放在盘子里给我。”王就甚忧愁，但因他所起的事，又因同席的人，就不肯推辞。随即差一个护卫兵吩咐拿约翰的头来，护卫兵就去在监里斩了约翰，把头放在盘子里，拿来给女子，女子就给他母亲。约翰的门徒听见了，就来把他的尸首领去，葬在坟墓里。The Gospel of the Lord. To accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, thank you, Saint Francis, and your rector, Maylie Hughes. Who's taking a wonderful vacation, much deserved, and I get to be here again with you. I was here prior to the COVID lockdown days, and again a time or two during those lockdown days, and it's just wonderful to see you again. And I'm humbled, deeply humbled, that I am here this week following the incredible time you shared together last Sunday. I did get to go back and watch what you did to honor our nation on July 4th. How beautiful it was for you to do the readings, the historic readings that began at the time of the Declaration of Independence on December 4th. I sorry, <laughs> July 4th. I don't know what. Maybe I wish it was just cooler. <laughs> July 4th of 1776. You know, you went, moved through to the Gettysburg ad Address by Lincoln, women's suffrage, from the pleas of the fairness of the native peoples of our land, to the cries for nonviolence from Cesar Chavez, so near to here, and even from our own uh, Japanese American native son, when you read from Norman Mineta and his words and his witness of being born here, a citizen of the United States, and yet treated as if he were not worthy. And finally, we did remember more recent times with President Ronald Reagan and his rearticulation at the uh, reopening of the Statue of Liberty and that torch of freedom 
for all people. Our nation formed on the principles that all persons are created equal. That is what we have been remembering. And what I want to call you into today is to look at how the ancient prophets of old in our Bible and the life of Jesus in our Bible are calling us today to fulfill what our forebearers saw in the founding of this country. It leads me to notice even in our psalm today, Psalm 85, that when we're seeking God's way of justice, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So we've all been experiencing this very difficult, complicated time during lockdown, and these ideals have been challenged between those who have been surviving okay and some have prospered during COVID days. And then there are those who have suffered mightily with unnecessary death and loss of income and so forth. And so how can we today think about as Christians, what are we to do when the bedrock of our faith is that there is justice in this universe and God seeks for all to have an equal distribution of what God has created. So I want to start with our prophet Amos today. Amos, who holds a plumb line metaphor, and I want you to notice if you can, that for my plumb line, my weight is a balloon holder. It is in the shape of a heart, and it says love. From a place of love, as you know, Amos is saying that God brought him out of being a shepherd, out of being one who trims the fruit trees, the sycamore trees, into becoming a prophet by first showing Amos that God intends for the righteousness, the mercy and truth to come together in justice and be aligned when the weight, as I will call it, the weight of God's love holds us in balance. Amos offered up his life, changing everything he was to do. And this was about 750 years before John the Baptist and Jesus came on the scene. Amos left the comfort of the pastoral life to go north to warn northern Israel, you are abusing your privileges. You, they literally had landowners who took the weights to measure out that which the hard-working tenants had produced and tipped the scale so that they would get more than their fair share. They literally were trying, as it were, to take advantage of the hard work of those in the lower classes, as it were, who did all the hard work. And Amos knew this from personal experience, and that is who God chose to be the first of the prophets, followed by Isaiah and others who warned Israel, you keep this up, you might feel prosperous today in your big houses and owning all that land, but you're going to lose it all. And sure enough, as we know, the exile, Assyrians did come and take over because Israel was not following the way of the one God of Israel, the God of justice and mercy, the God who made a plan that there would be enough for everyone, the God who they denied a little bit when they decided to take on some of the rites and rituals of the pagan religions. Exile, shame, loss of wealth. In Jesus' time, there were other imperial forces at work. 
We've heard terrible things about Herod, first Herod the Great, killing the innocents when Jesus was born. And now today we hear of Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is threatened first by the words of John the Baptist, who is calling Herod to task for his greed, for his uh, uh, efforts to try to build up his kingdom. Because, you know, the reason he married his half-brother's wife was because he believed his older half-brother would get more land from Herod the Great, their father, by marrying the ex-wife, Herodias, as we call her, Herod Antipas thought he would broaden his kingdom. He'd have more land. Well, John the Baptist calls him out and says, this is adulterous and it will fail. Herod Antipas is annoyed by this and thought he could first just kind of quell that argument by putting him away in prison until a 12-year-old comes along and Hard to imagine. I know when I was 12, I thought, what was he thinking? <laughs> what was he thinking offering anything in his land to a 12-year-old who was manipulated by her mother, of course? And this loss of John the Baptist, the voice crying out in the wilderness saying, make way the righteousness and clear the paths for the one who will take us back along the way of truth and mercy and love and justice. Now, I find it perplexing in some ways and very sad in other ways that Jesus didn't come down to Jerusalem to speak up and, and quell this argument. But Jesus couldn't. Jesus was listening to this voice of justice and listening to what his mission was. And so he did not go. And I can imagine how abandoned John the Baptist may have felt because of Jesus not coming. And we know this story of John the Baptist really happened because it's not only in all four canonical Gospels, but the Jewish historian Josephus writes of John the Baptist. Because Josephus is writing the story of Judaism and how did we get where we are not long after Jesus' life. So this is a significant turning point in our understanding of God's prophecy to Israel and by extension to us as followers of Jesus Christ. So now we're wondering about Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, and what is his true mission? Knowing himself to be the son of God, he's had his temptations in the wilderness, and now John the Baptist has made way, and John is even out of the way for Jesus to do what he proclaimed in the Gospel of Luke as his mission, reading from the scroll of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So that is what Jesus does. Regrouping, bringing his disciples together on the Sea of Galilee, and he just starts bringing the good news to the poor. He soon gathers thousands, and he not only tells them, God loves you, God's mercy is for you, you count for something. He feeds them. He heals them. He sets them free. And this is the Jesus we follow 2,000 years later. 
This is the Jesus that preached good news to the poor, not just by talking in synagogues to say that's what we're supposed to do, but by leaving synagogues and going out into the streets, as it were, and bringing good news to the poor. So prior to our year and a half of COVID lockdown, I had retired from full-time ministry in order to pursue more opportunities to do this good news to the poor kind of work. I was following in the way of current prophets. Some of you may know well, some it might be new. But the Reverend Jim Wallace of Sojourners, right? I see a nod or two. A prophetic voice for the progressive evangelical Christian of which I will claim connection. And he partnered with the Reverend Dr. William Barber II of the Poor People's Campaign. I see one clapping. Indeed, the prophet of our day who has picked up the mantle from Martin Luther King Jr. from the 60s and has said, we need to preach. We are responsible to serve the poor. We are to preach good news to the poor and do the work that helps people in poverty, in low wage, those who are disenfranchised. Now, I know in some ways I'm preaching to the choir. You are aware of this. But I want to bring you up to speed with what I have experienced and which I invite you to be a part of right here in San Jose, California. Because COVID-19 meant that instead of me going and being trained in Washington, D.C. and jumping on a bandwagon with people in the Washington, D.C. area, I was able to go online, participate with all those at Washington, D.C. safely from my home, and meanwhile develop relationships right here at home in the San Francisco Bay Area with the Poor People's Campaign, including right here in San Jose. So listening to the two prophets of Christian leadership that I referred to, alerting us long before the pandemic, at least five years prior in the May of 2016, Wallace and Barber were together in South Carolina giving a talk on how America has, <laughs> is in danger, as Wallace says, of losing the soul of America because of the sin of racism. That's the beginning. We must reconcile. And so what these uh, prophets are calling for and now have put into the hands of our elected officials, including Barbara Lee from Alameda County, Oakland, Congressional District. She is African American. She has put forth a resolution directly addressing a third reconstruction, addressing poverty from the bottom up. We must change our practices. And in so doing, we must address five interlocking injustices that have caused our nation to falter in its dream for all to be equal. Poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, militarism and the war economy, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. These five have to be addressed, and we, speaking to Christian audiences, speaking of people with a moral conscience and of all faiths, need to find a way to work together, work together to move out of our time of isolation, COVID-19, and into the next phase by recreating a new phase of understanding equality. The first Reconstruction was following the Civil War. 
And do you remember that as Lincoln so wonderfully wanted the equalities to occur, they assassinated the voice for equality. And then a hundred years later, as Martin Luther King Jr. offered up, we want to, the America to cash in on its promise of equality for all and allow the voting rights that all men and women of all races have the right to vote for their freedom and to receive wages commensurate with what it costs to live in this country. And they assassinated him. Here we are some 50 plus years now down the road. We must pick up that mantle. And some of us, including your own deacon, Stephanie Cooper, Deacon Chaplain Kathy Crow from San Jose State University Ministries, and other Episcopalians and non-Episcopalians from this region gathered on June 7, 2021, along with the Moral Monday movement of William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign, and we put forth at the steps of Zolofgren our Congressional District Representative to Congress. We're giving you the plan for this third recon, uh, reconstruction. We ask you to implement it, and we will be there to help bring about changes for poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, militarism, the war economy, and a distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. And we can claim to be there because we know Amos didn't give up his life as a shepherd to be a prophet for God for love, justice, and mercy. He didn't give that up so we could have bigger houses and more land. John the Baptist didn't give up his life where he had the right to be the son of a priest at the temple at Jerusalem, and he gave that up, and he gave up his very life so that we would turn around and turn our lives to the righteous way of love and mercy. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross so that you and I could be wealthy in the United States of America, in the city which my husband said he read last week, city of San Jose, has more people with $30 million per year annual salary than anywhere else on the planet. That may not be you and me like my husband said, but it is here. We are here and we can make the difference to repent, to, which means to turn around, motivate people, make changes that will bring equity for all people. Because if we are not preaching the good news of Jesus Christ to the poor, then we are not preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us stand and proclaim our faith, saying the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. 
For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people. Friends, we have been chosen by God in Christ to be holy and blameless before God in love. Offer your prayers saying, O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people. Lord, have mercy. We thank you, Lord Christ, that you have redeemed us, that you forgive us our trespasses, that you lavish us with grace. Grant to your church understanding that we may accomplish your purposes. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people. Lord, have mercy. O God, raise up prophets to, like your servants John the Baptizer and the prophets of old. Give courage and clarity to those who would speak truth to the world's power. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, the earth is yours and all that is in it, the world and all who dwell therein. Give us wisdom as we steward what belongs to you. Give us the will to care for your creation. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people. Lord, have mercy. Just as David employed men to carry the sacred ark, we acknowledge before you our reliance on the efforts of others. Bless those who labor on our behalf and for our benefit. We pray for the day when all workers will earn a fair wage. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people. Lord, have mercy. When we call, you answer us, O God. And though you are high, you care for the lowly. Hear our prayers for those who are in need, especially Richard, Dan, Donna, Arlene, Captain Austin, Davidson, serving the church and people in Bogota, Colombia, those in the U.S. and throughout the world infected with COVID-19, the families of those victims and those still waiting on the, uh, for the missing in the Miami building collapse, for those affected by the extreme weather, and for those now named silently aloud or in the comments. For the unemployed and underemployed. The houseless and the underhoused. O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people. We have received life in Christ Jesus the Lord, and we have come to fullness in him. Hear our prayers of thanksgiving and praise, especially for those celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, and other special occasions this week, including Kayla, Evelyn, Thomas, Janet, Adeline, and those now named silently, aloud, or in the comments. O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people. God has raised Christ from the dead and made us alive in him. Receive into the fullness of your divine life those who have died, 
especially those from COVID-19 and from the collapsed building in Miami, from the, the record numbers being killed by the heat, and those now named silently aloud are in the comments. O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people. Lord, have mercy. 上帝啊，主曾经使我们在共同生活中联系在一起。当我们为正义和真理奋斗时，求主帮助我们彼此面对，不存怨恨和恶毒的心，以互谅互敬的精神一起工作。这都是靠着我们的主耶稣基督。
So, just, just saying. Now, the other thing is, this is our first Sunday with the new piano, tuned, functioning, and uh, we are 60-some percent of the way towards our goal of raising $60,000 for the purchase, moving, and ongoing tuning and whatever needs to be done. The piano tuner came back from 4th of July early to come Monday afternoon to work on the piano. He thought he'd be here for an hour and a half. He stayed for three. He was very, very impressed. And his way of doing things I like. He just said Let's, he's going to come back in, three, in, in a month and we'll see how it's doing and we'll go step by step to see what it takes. But there is no doubt that this piano will help uh, make this a center for the performing arts, which was a motivating factor behind the remodel. And uh, this will ensure St. Francis uh, survival into the future. It's a gift to the church and a gift to the community. So the punchline, here it comes. If you have purchased one or more keys, there are still keys to donate. And uh, if you have not, then please consider uh, making a donation. And if it's not a whole key, we'll take half a key. You know, when I sat down to play the piano at the, at the home down where it came from, I thought, what's the matter with these keys? They look strange. And halfway through the second page of music, I thought, oh, this piano was made in Germany in the eight, mid-80s. They still used ivory. It's not plastic. So I haven't tickled ivories in a long time. So anyway, thank you for your generosity. And while I'm here, I also have to say I am extremely touched by the generosity of the uh, Mandarin-speaking members of our congregation. So a special thanks to them. It's amazing to me. So at some point, do you only play the keys that are painful? Yeah, you, we, we'll have a special thing after church some Sunday, and you can put on a hazmat suit and three masks, and you'll get to play your note. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you again very much for being here and for tuning in. Sorry we had a little technical snafu just before service, but everyone in uh, San Jose understands that when Windows decides to update, Windows updates. Thank you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust. And we turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his wounds we are healed. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. We who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, gave thanks, and said, he broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we, we celebrate, celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rachel, Leah, and Rebecca, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. 
Nope. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing our Father. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
gracious God, you know what is in our hearts better than we do. In this bowl, we have put before you some of our prayers of intention, need, sorrow, and thanksgiving. We offer these to you knowing that your son promised that those who pray in secret will be rewarded openly. We pray that our love for you may overflow more and more with the knowledge and full insight until our love is like that of your son, Jesus Christ, and embraces all of your creation. Amen. Let us pray the post-communion prayer together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.